fishes is the most diverse group of vertebrates on the planet. And with over 33,000 living species, sometimes it can be a bit confusing and often surprising as to what constitutes as a fish. So what exactly is a fish? And why should we care? If I showed you these 10 generally well-known animals, would you be able to differentiate the fishes from the non-fishes? Here, take a closer look. Pause the video if you need some time. I'll even help you out and put down the most commonly used names. How do you think you did? Well, stick around. By the end of this video, we'll most assuredly have a better idea of what a fish is, and I'll reveal which of these 10 animals are fishes. Now I bet you already have a very good idea of what a fish is. I bet many of us, when we first hear the word fish or fishes, immediately think of our favorite water-themed animated movie, like The Little Mermaid or Finding Nemo. And others may think of those vibrantly colored creatures gracefully mingling over coral reefs and within tall kelp forests. Others may immediately think of the sport of fishing, or perhaps commercial fishing and aquaculture. Or perhaps some of us just think of food, and fishes come in all shapes, sizes, and colors. And after hundreds of millions of years of evolution, and with an extraordinary array of adaptations, the fishes have figured out how to essentially colonize the entire planet, populating both hemispheres, in the deepest parts of the oceans and in hypersaline seas, in landbound lakes and ephemeral ponds, to raging rivers and mountain streams. They even live in underground caves, and in hidden oases in arid deserts, and also under the freezing arctic ices. Through the millennia, the fishes have greatly influenced the lives of humanity, within industry, culture, and religion, and within every spiritual and intellectual crevice in between. And that holds true, even now on this day. Many populations of humans are directly dependent on the oceans and fishes as a way of life. As most humanity lives within 60 miles of a major body of water. With so much biodiversity on our blue planet, Often it can be difficult to distinguish as to what classifies as what within the animal kingdom, especially within the waters, a habitat that still offers a vast amount of scientific uncertainties and awaiting discovery. There are still thousands of fishes left undiscovered in our world. Now that's pretty nifty. We're going to take a closer look as to what makes a fish a fish. Hello everyone, Koa here. This is the first video in a mini educational web series devoted towards two passions of mine, science and fishes. Better said, ichthyology, or a branch of zoology that deals with the biology of fishes. Now I know that everyone is not enthused about fishes as I. Well, perhaps this little girl is. And for many, the thought of a mucus covered fish makes them squirm, or the thought of a big shark in murky waters gives them the heebie jeebies. But I do believe that most all of us are intrigued, if not fascinated, by the animal kingdom and have an appreciation for the splendiferous beauty and the mesmerizing complexity that is nature. So this web series is devoted towards teaching the basics about fishes, and then some, for a general audience of all ages, with the intention of being easy to follow, enjoyable, but most of all, a bit educational. So without further ado, let's get right into it. So what is a fish? Yeah, that's a fish. Well, like most endeavors within the sciences, from systematics to definitions to theories, not all scientists, professionals, and researchers are always in agreement, which is actually the imperative driving force behind scientific progression. We build and expand on the wisdom and knowledge of our ancestors. And without the criticisms and consensuses of our peers within the scientific community, we would still be thinking that the world is the center of the universe and that alchemy is the grandest form of chemistry. And the definition of a fish is no different, as it has been dynamically changing since it was first described. You would be hard pressed to find matching definitions of a fish in different ichthyology texts. I'm going to take you to a definition of a fish that I had first learned in my first ichthyology course years ago. A fish is an aquatic vertebrate with gills throughout life and limbs, if any, in the shape of fins. Now that's not a bad definition at all. I like Nelson's definition, but I'm going to put an asterisk right next to it, and I'll explain why later. First, let's break down that definition so it'll be easier to understand. Aquatic. Okay, well that's an easy one. 
What do we think of when we hear the word aquatic? Water, exactly. That just means that the animals are predominantly growing in or living in water. Vertebrate or vertebrate. Now that's a bit more esoteric, but that basically means having vertebra or a backbone or a spinal column that provides support to the body and protects the spinal cord or notochord. Now, to get a bit more technical, when we are referring to vertebrates, we are referring to all animals within the phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata. Now, you are already quite familiar with the vertebrates, considering that you are one. If you ever had a pet dog or cat or turtle or bird, well, those are vertebrates too. The described living vertebrates, fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, make up less than 5% of all known animal species. The rest are invertebrates, without a backbone. The fishes are a paraphyletic group, meaning that it's a group with its last common ancestor and all descendants of that ancestor, with the exception of one or two monophyletic groups. Where in this case, the tetrapods, which are the amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals, are not included. Now, I know that's a bit confusing unless you're a biology major, so let me show you. So around 520 million years ago, the vertebrates came into existence. Soon we saw the jawless fishes emerge, the ignathans, which are represented now by the orders of Mixiniformes, or the hagfishes, and the Petromyzontiformes, or the lampreys. Then the jawed vertebrates, or nathostomes, came to be in the Ordovician somewhere around 450 million years ago. The nathostomes, now represented by the living groups of chondrichthys, or cartilaginous fishes, better known as sharks, skates, rays, and ratfishes, or chimeras, and utelostomi, or the bony vertebrates. From there, fast forward 30 million years to about 420 million years ago. The first actinopterygians, or rayfin fishes, made their presence known on Earth, now representing 96% of all living species of fishes. We're talking tuna, piranha, tetra, cichlids, salmonids, well over 30,000 species of fishes. And the other bony vertebrates mentioned here, the Sarcopterygians, showing up about 418 million years ago, now represented by only 8 living species of fishes, 2 coelacanths, and 6 lungfishes. But the Sarcopterygians would arguably progress to be the most successful animals on Earth via the tetrapods. And around 390 million years ago, that's when the tetrapods started to appear. There are a few fossils of an ancient fish called Tiktaalik rosea, that is an absolute ideal representation of how the fishes made the transition into terrestrial tetrapods. That is, how vertebrates evolved to live on land. And even though Tiktaalik may not be the direct ancestor of modern day tetrapods, this magnificent fish, or fishapod, as it is often called, has been a revolutionary discovery of great magnitude. So again, the fishes are a paraphyletic group of vertebrates, and so often when we refer to the actinopterygians or rayfin fishes, and sarcopterygians, the lobefin fishes, ichthyologists like to refer to them as the group of osteichthys, or bony fishes, replacing utelostomi, bony vertebrates. That is, after we exclude the monophyletic group of tetrapoda. But in truth, you and I, well, we're osteichthys. We are bony fish. So is this dude, and this dude, and this dude. As of now, dipnoi, or the lungfishes, are the closest living relatives to tetrapods, or us. Okay, take a breath. It's a lot less technical from here on out. Let's go back to our definition. What have we covered? Aquatic, lives in water, and vertebrate. Has a spinal column. Good, what's next? Gills. Gills are just respiratory organs that extract dissolved oxygen from water, excreting carbon dioxide as a byproduct. And lastly, we have fins. Well, that's just an attached appendage to the body. Except the fishes, such as the bony fishes, have rays and spines covered in skin in a webbed fashion, and the cartilaginous fishes, well, their fins look more like paddles and flippers. So remember that asterisk I threw up on the definition? Well, let me explain why. Aquatic. Well, not all fishes spend the entirety of their time in water. Some fishes, such as lungfishes, are capable of spending up to four years burrowed in the ground, or estivating, during periods of drought or low water. Mudskippers are capable of leaving the water during low tide in search of food or mates. The snakeheads are capable of walking on land from water source to water source. 
And the second part of our definition. Well, let's go to vertebrates. It's been an up and down sort of disagreement agreement when it comes to lampreys and hagfishes within ichthyology and systematics and figuring out who belongs as a fish and who doesn't. Overall, as of now, hagfishes and lampreys are inclusive in fishes, even though hagfishes don't necessarily have a vertebral column. But this is thought to be a secondary loss, or reverse evolution. Now that just means that their ancestor possessed the trait and it was lost over time. And the third part of our definition, gills. Well, let's go back to our lungfishes. Well, all lungfishes except for the Australian lungfish are obligate air breathers, meaning that they have to use their lungs to breathe atmospheric oxygen, not dissolved oxygen in water, because their gills are so atrophied in adulthood. Now, we have lungs, and the lungs of lungfishes are homologous to what we have, meaning that if you follow the course of time, their lungs were our lungs. And there are many other species of fishes that have lungs, or modified swim bladders, or some different anatomical feature where they're not entirely using gills in order to incorporate oxygen into their respiratory system. Those bettas that you see in pet stores, or Asian fighting fish as sometimes they're called, well, they're capable of sitting in those jars looking all sad without any aeration because they're capable of going up to the surface and gulping air. Fins and limbs. Well, not all fishes have limbs and definitely not fins in the way that we may think of them. The hagfishes, lampreys, and many eels, well, they really only have a modified caudal fin for locomotion. Overall, a definition for a fish that I find to be more befitting comes from Hastings, Walker, and Galland. Fishes usually live in water, usually obtain oxygen through gills, are usually ectothermic, i.e. cold-blooded, and usually have limbs in the form of fins. Can you see why I like that definition? With the quadruple plugging of the word usually, it simply accounts for all the anomalies of extreme variance within the fishes. For reiteration, there are a lot of extant species of fishes on the planet. And when I say extant, or extant, I'm simply referring to in existence, which is a word meaning roughly the opposite of extinct. Now there's an estimated 82 orders of fishes, and over 500 families, and over 33,000 species of fishes. And those are only the ones that we know about. There are still thousands left undiscovered. Now I'm going to put this into perspective for you. Not only are there more fishes than the amphibians, more fishes than the reptiles, more fishes than the birds, and more fishes than the mammals, there are more fishes than all four of those other groups combined. So why should we care what the fishes are? Well, besides any ethical obligations we owe to them, and their sheer awesomeness, humanity is quite dependent on the fishes. Yeah, I'm serious. And our first steps towards understanding our relationship to the fishes is understanding what fishes are. I salute anyone from marine biologists to conservationists to volunteers that are working to preserve and understand fishes and all of wildlife. As a global society, we know that overfishing is bad and pollution is bad and global warming is bad, but we still have corporations and nations tirelessly working against nature, eliminating precious habitats such as coral reefs and eradicating irreplaceable species, all the while completely disrupting vital ecosystems that we too are dependent upon. We are living in a mass extinction event. Yes, what killed the dinosaurs was called the mass extinction event. I'm not exaggerating here. There are species going extinct every single day. The best way to help, whether you are 7 or 70, is just to embrace the truth. Learn about fishes. Learn about the oceans. Learn about your connection to the world's waters and nature. Truth is the ambrosia of progression, albeit at times it can be rather bitter. To sum it up, a fish is usually going to be found in water, usually going to have fins, usually going to have gills, and usually going to be ectothermic. But there are exceptions to all of those rules. Watch more of my videos. Learn more about fishes. I'll catch you all later. Okay, I'm going to reveal which ones are fishes on this board. And if you want a more detailed explanation, watch my other video where I'll go over each one.